So the talk is entitled Singlet Triplet Host Pink Qubit in Panel Germanium, and the speaker is Daniel Jirovets from IST Austria. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, my name is Daniel. I work at IST Austria in the group of Georgios Katsaros, which has been mentioned quite a lot uh, before in the talk of my novelators. And actually, also very happy that he introduced all the good things about germanium, so I don't have to uh, introduce them as well. But I will talk about a different um, property of germanium that we have actually leveraged in order to realize a single triplet qubit for holes in this system. Um, so single triplet qubits are, have been around since quite some time. And what you need is, well, the two, the two spins that make the single and triplet states, they uh, interact via, via the exchange interaction. And the other thing you need is a uh, Zeeman energy difference between them. And this can be achieved in different ways. For example, you can have magnetic field differences, for example, generated by the local Overhauser field of the nuclei in calcium arsenide, also in silicon. This has been shown in this paper. Or what you can do is put a micromagnet on top of your structure and generate a magnetic field gradient. The other way is that you leverage on difference in the properties of the charge carriers that you use to, to make your spin qubit. And is especially the spin orbit interaction can alter the G factors in, in the two dots. So you can get G factor differences from the spin orbit interaction. This has been shown in silicon moss structures and also in silicon germanium, uh, in silicon silicon germanium heterostructures where the spin orbit interaction from the belly states um, was used to drive some of the triplet oscillations. But in all of these experiments, what you need in order to drive at megahertz frequencies is relatively large magnetic fields. So you see a G factor of 0.002 results in 10 megahertz of oscillation frequency at 500 millitesla. And I want to show you here that by leveraging on the really cool properties of germanium, you can get G factor differences that are much, much larger and you can drive the qubits in germanium much, much faster. So the, the reason for this is that uh, the holes that are confined in these germanium heterostructures are of heavy hole type. And they have large G factors in the direction of maximum confinement. And these G factors are furthermore dependent on the heavy hole light hole mixing. And this heavy hole light hole mixing is dependent on the confinement and actually also on the filling of the quantum dot. And a colleague of mine, Hannes Watzinger, has shown in hot wires in germanium that simply by adding more and more holes to your quantum dot, you can change the out of plane, so the, the, in the direction of maximum confinement G factor, uh, quite a bit by simply adding more and more holes. And also recently in a two-dimensional system, this has been shown, simply adding more and more holes, the G factors can be altered. Now our heterostructure looks, looks like this. It's very similar to what also has been used in Dell. We just have a bit more germanium in the barriers. Um, the structure looks, looks under TEM very clean. And in this germanium uh, layer, is this is where you will trap your heavy hole states. And uh, yeah, our, our wafers are grown by the group of Giovanni Zella in Como. And these TM pictures are, uh, were performed at uh, the group of Jordi Arbiol in Barcelona. Um, and once we get our wafers, our design then, our gate design then looks like this. We have several gates that define a double quantum dot where the two holes will reside. And then we do, we do readout via this charge sensor that is hooked up to a reflectometer circuit. And what I should note here is that we are not working in the one-one regime where you typically operate uh, single triplet qubits. We're working in with three holes in the left quantum dot and an unknown number of holes in the right one because we cannot empty the right dot. So we don't actually know how many, how many holes there are. But what we know is that the different filling should lead to different G factors in the two dots. So we actually expect 
a relatively large G factor difference between the two dots. And uh, now, if we look at single triplet oscillations, we first have to check the Hamiltonian of the system. So we have the exchange interaction that will give us the splitting between the single and the triplet. And we have the G factor differences between the two dots that are in the off diagonal term. Now, the, the exchange interaction you can control by simply bringing the dots closer together or further apart. And this is done by electrically tuning this, this epsilon, which is the detuning. Uh, in our convention, high detuning actually means that the dots are far apart. That means the exchange interaction is small. In this situation, these two terms are dominant, and this will be co corresponding to an X rotation, so between singlet and triplet knot. And um, when you have small epsilon, you will have a large exchange interaction. And that means that you are doing exchange oscillations that happen then on the equator of the Bloch sphere. So the angle at which you're rotating will always depend on the ratio between these two terms. And what we, what we did at first is just look at single triplet oscillations. And here you see the pulse that we're applying is very simple. It's just a square pulse at maximum epsilon, so the, the, the highest epsilon we can apply. And then we let the system evolve freely by itself. And then we observe what returns back. If it's a singlet, it will tunnel. If it's a triplet, then Pauli spin blockade pre um, prevents it from tunneling. And then you can see this oscillation in the signal. And uh, what you should notice is that the oscillation frequency goes above 100 megahertz. But what's important here is the magnetic field. It's at four millitesla. So we have a G factor difference of two. That's 1,000 times bigger than what you would see in, in electrons in silicon. So this qubit is going extremely fast at very, very, very low fields. And moreover, this is reproducible. We have done this in two more devices that had very similar gate layout. And every time we could find a G factor difference of the same order of magnitude. And actually what we could also find is that we could always empty the left dot, but never the right one. So we were never sure about the exact number of holes in the right dot. And these measurements, these additional ones here were done by my colleague, Josef Kukuczka, by the way. So, okay, this Cupid is very fast. And what we did then is also look at T2 star at one millitesla. And what we saw is that by simply changing the detuning, the T2 star follows a very characteristic um, function, which is also valid actually for, for electrons. You have two noise sources. One is electrical noise on the exchange interaction, which is weighed by this derivative uh, with, of J with respect to epsilon. And then you have the other term that determines the noise on the Zeeman part. And what we found is that um, the charge noise is very much comparable to similar devices in gallium arsenide and silicon, while the, the magnetic noise is a bit smaller than in gallium arsenide, resulting in a generally larger T2 star, but it's this term is a bit bigger than natural silicon, so we have a slightly lower T2 star, so a bit lower than a microsecond. And uh, what is also interesting is that since the frequency is dependent directly on the magnetic field, we want to look at what happens to the, to the coherence time or the, the dephasing time, and we see that, yes, it decreases a bit, but effectively, the increase in frequency is, high, is larger than what you lose in coherence time. So the Q factor effectively goes up with magnetic field. And the other cool thing is that we can extend the coherence time by doing echo measurements. So um, when we let the system evolve at very large uh, detuning, we can then refocus it after a certain amount of time with an exchange pulse, and this effectively increases the coherence time all the way up to 150 or more microseconds. What you can see here are the oscillations after the last recovery pulse. Um, this red curve here is this point, and the gray curve here, where you still see oscillations, is this point here. So after more than 100 microseconds, we really see this qubit is still working pretty nice. 
And actually very similar to what also Menno has shown before, um, when we plot the T2 as a function of the number of pi pulses, we can extract this um, uh, power law dependence. And with this exponent beta equal 0.5, you see that this is limited by one over F noise. Where it comes from, we don't know, but this is very typical for uh, semiconductor qubits. Now, the last topic I want to talk about is the tunability of the G-factor difference. And what we found is in general in our devices that the gate that is most affecting the difference in the G-factors is the center barrier gate. So the one that is separating the two quantum dots and controlling the tunnel coupling is also controlling the G factor difference. And in the device that I measured, what we saw is that by increasing the center barrier voltage, the G factor difference goes down. What Josip measured in his device is exactly the opposite. So he measured that the G factor difference goes up with the center barrier voltage. Now, since we don't know the number of holes in the right dot uh, and could be different in the two cases, the dot mm -hmm. shapes could be different, we actually don't really know why we have these two different um, trends. But what we were thinking is that maybe we can find a region where actually this is relatively flat. So how much can we push this up, this G-factor difference? And yeah, Josip found that he managed in a different, again, different feeling to get this G factor difference all the way up to 4.5. And this is another factor of two higher than what I, that what I already had measured before. So this incredibly large G factor difference, you now should be also able to drive even faster at incredibly low fields. And so what, what we did uh, is, or what Josip did is to try this, to drive this qubit as fast as he could. And he went up to 10 millitesla in field. And what you can see is that you can still kind of distinguish the oscillations up here all the way up to like sort of 700 nanoseconds for sure. And the reason why we had to split this into three plots is that on the one hand side, the qubit is so fast that we need a lot of points in order to resolve these oscillations. On the other hand, it's also coherent enough that it's not decaying after two or three oscillations, but you can really observe them for a longer amount of time. And if you then look at the FFT, so the Fourier transform of these plots, you can see that at 10, uh, 10 millitesla, we're touching 600 megahertz of oscillation frequency. Now, the record for uh, EDSR driven spin qubit in, in germanium at least is for around 500 megahertz. And because of the power broadening of the line, you kind of completely lose the coherence. But here, because the qubit is driving itself, simply because of the Hamiltonian, you kind of man manage to maintain coherence and you increase your Q factor above 200 already. So we are, we are really reaching uh, really, really interesting regimes here. So now in conclusion, uh, I've shown you that heavy hole states have very large G factors in the out of plane direction. And that by uh, leveraging the heavy hole light hole mixing, one can also induce very large G factor difference between the dots. And by having these G factors going as high as four or even higher, you can, you can get oscillation frequencies that are in excess of 600 megahertz at fields that are still below the critical field of aluminum. So here you're, you're starting to reach uh, singlet triplet splittings that go in the, in the direction of uh, superconducting resonator frequency. So, and you can still operate the superconductors even though you're using an out of plane field. So all of this, while still maintaining also relatively long coherence time. So this qubit is incredibly fast and incredibly coherent at the same time. And moreover, there is a lot of interest in physics also to study in the other magnetic field directions. But unfortunately, I don't have time for that. But if you're interested, you can send me an email or check out our website and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for the nice talk. Talk is open for discussion. I don't see any questions from the chat or Discord. Um, so one question I have is, um, how do you see the progress towards multi-qubit operations? What are the challenges? What are the timescales you expect to develop like a two-qubit processor? Well, let's say in, in with single triplet qubits or in general. Yeah, so I, I thought that I thought that you I, I do like this single triplet qubit because it's really fast and coherent. So yeah. it would be nice to use it in a, in, a, in, a, in a processor. Yes. So effectively, since since the two qubit gate of a single triplet qubit works kind of similarly to the single triplet qubit itself, simply by turning on and off an exchange interaction, um, the only difficulty is to have enough control lines next to each other. Uh, we're working on, on four, four dots in a line. Um, so I, 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 I think that within, within not so long, we can have, we can have a two qubit gate. Um, yeah, we can have a two qubit gate. Mm -hmm. Good. Whether whether that then can be uh, scaled up even more, considering also what uh, what Meno mentioned that you should not increase the control lines too much, we will definitely need to need to find better ways in order to control our qubits uh, rather than having so many gates to define just one. Finding ways to still have tunability but also reproducibility. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you, you, you described the qubit quality in terms of the quality factor and uh, I think uh, dephasing time uh, and rabi time. Um, could you also describe it in terms of fidelity or have you tried doing randomized benchmarking, for example? Yeah, so the, the randomized benchmarking for single triplet qubits is a bit more uh, tricky than, than for lost Vincenzo qubits because of the non-orthogonal axis. So we have started to, um, to implement a code that can calculate the, the best uh, gates in order to, to have high fidelity, but we have actually not tried it out on our qubit, uh, unfortunately. This is definitely on our to-do list, even before doing the two qubit gates, we should, uh, we should definitely characterize this, this qubit in terms of fidelity, because a high speed without a good fidelity doesn't bring us much, obviously. And I think actually that also when, when once we have high fidelity gates, we, we will also be able to um, uh, extend the coherence time much better because right now our refocusing pulse might actually not be the best pulse in order to refocus the noise that, we, that is induced in our system. So yeah, gate fidelity is definitely in our to-do list. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that if I understand correctly, then this extremely nice qubit is based on uh, some kind of an unwanted inhomogeneity in your structure in the sense that your two dots are not looking the same. They have these different, largely different G factors. Yep. Somehow you make use of this uh, non-uniformity. So in the long run, if you want to scale up, uh, will this help or will this hurt more? Do we have a vision about this? That is actually, so, <laughs> We did not expect to have this. So it was more luck to find this actually, uh, to be honest. Um, it, depends, it depends a lot on how, how well we can tune this. If we can decide at the, the sample design by simply saying, okay, we want the larger or a smaller dot because the dot shape itself is already enough to tune the G factor difference a bit. If we can decide this while fabricating, and we have enough reproducibility, then I think it will be a good asset. If on the other hand, we see that, that we don't have a lot of reproducibility, then I effectively do see this as a, as a problem, but on the long term, we will have to see simply how, how reproducible our devices can be. I think it's a, it's a cool asset um, and it, yeah. It, it, it's definitely worth investigating further, especially really knowing how many holes we have will, will definitely help us 
to understand it better. Great, thank you very much.